For all you ground uppers out there, this podcast is for you. Okay. This is the Fan of Fan podcast, and I'm topless. And for all you ground uppers out there, this podcast is for you. Big, big episode tonight. We're joined by Everton fan and very famous ground upper, Graham Holmes. How are you, mate? I'm fine. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> I'm not sure about the famous bit, but yeah, thank you. I'm good. <laughs> we'll get to that in a bit. I don't know why. But uh, yeah, thank you for coming on, mate. It's great to finally well, have you. Yeah. Here. This is going to be a good one. I've got a great Good team. to join you. Thank you, mate. Yeah, so Graham Holmes from Liverpool, of course. How did you get into football? How did it all start for you, mate? Well, it started basically as a as a sort of a young lad. My dad took me to Goodison for the first time when I was six, six or seven, a uh, long time ago now, I won't say when. And uh, I got into to watching Everton back then in those days. Uh, my second game ever was an 8-0 win against Southampton at Goodison in 1971. And I think I thought it was always going to be like that. I thought every time I went, it was going to be an 8-0 win, but I don't think I've had one since, to be honest. So it's certainly not been like that since. Uh, so yeah, I got back into watching Everton like a long time ago. Uh, got my first season ticket when I was 18. And I've had a season ticket now for 40 years, so it's like I'm into my 41st season. Uh, being at both ends of the ground, uh, the Gladys Street to start with, and then when they built the park end stand, the new park end stand, I switched over to there because most of the lads of my age were sort of switched to the park end. So I've been in the park end since 95, which was good. Uh, and so that's a football thing with Everton. So I go to most away games, not all, probably about half, maybe two thirds. And then I've also got into the ground hopping side from uh, going back to about 87, really. I, I think I've been to about 40 new grounds with Everton or away grounds with Everton. And I decided we had a really a couple of bad seasons. And I thought, well, as well as going to the home games, I want to do some new grounds and try and complete the 92. And it was always something I'd looked at when I was younger. I always liked when I went in my dad's car somewhere, you'd look for the floodlights when you went to a new city or a new town, one of the first things you did. Um, and I'd got into like that side of things sort of early on. I was, I liked the shoot league tables where you, you moved the league ladders and you looked at the names of the the uh, the grounds on each, each team, on each uh, little tab. So I, I think I knew all the names of the grounds when I was quite young, but it was a case of like, well, I've got to visit them now. And then one of the other things that, that came to mind was uh, I went on a course for me, uh, professional exams, and talking to a couple of guys in London. And they said, what, what we do every weekend is we get a pools coupon out. And we sort of go down it and wherever we stab, we go to that game at the weekend. Now, we probably couldn't do it nowadays where you need tickets. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea, isn't it? Like you could get Lincoln one week and then the next week it might be Dumbarton and then the next week it might be Gillingham. So I sort of got into it a little bit there thinking, oh, I'd like to do that. But then I think once I got to like 40 or 50 of the 92, for me then I wanted to do the rest of them. And it became an option once I got old enough to, to, to be able to do it. First few I went on the train. Then when I learned to drive, I remember I passed my test in August. Uh, and I remember saying to me, Dad, I'm going to Hartlepool tonight. And he, I, you are messing. What, what do you mean you're going to Hartlepool? I said, well, I'm going to new ground. Ground number 56 is Hartlepool. I'm doing it. And it's like, you don't even know the way. You've never even, you've only driven a car for three days. But that was, that was the goal for me. I wanted to do it. So, like, once I'd got to Hartlepool and proved I could get there and back and have no accidents and so on, the world was my oyster then. I had a car. I had, you know, another 35, 36 grand to get to. So, go for it. And that's what I did. And I, I became, like, I wanted to do it. So, Saturdays, when it was an away game, like, I didn't want to go to. It was a new ground. And I do try and do Tuesdays and Wednesdays as well. So I had a job at the time where I could go and work in different parts of the country. So I had like a couple of dream ones where I went to London and I did Orient on a Tuesday night and Brighton on a Wednesday. I did Millwall midweek and somewhere else down Gillingham, I think it was. And it was a case of like, I could do overnight stays, drive back. And in those days, driving back from the South Coast on a night was no big deal to me. I think it's a bit harder now when you get older. So that was like, I really wanted to do the 92. And I think I, I got to about 56, as I said, in the, the August. And I think I'd finished it by the following March. I'd got me 92. The last couple were difficult because, again, in those days, uh, we had issues with Scunthorpe. You needed a pass for, you needed a membership. Uh, you probably won't remember that, but at the old showground, you had to have a membership card. It was in the days where 
I think there was issues with football at the time and Luton, you needed a membership card. So it was hard to get the Scunthorpe one. And then my last two were Bournemouth and Portsmouth. And I needed to get a ticket. Bournemouth were playing Bradford, which was no big deal. But again, you couldn't get a ticket in those days easily enough to get one. So I managed to do it and managed to finish the 92 in March 88. And then moving on from that, once I'd done that, then the next logical place was to go with Scotland. So it was like, I want to do Scotland now. And I, every free Saturday, it was like up, up to Scotland. I was doing midweeks where Tuesdays and Wednesdays, it would have been much easier now where you can do Fridays, Saturdays and Sunday games. But again, in those days, it was very rare to have a Sunday game. You would go on a Saturday, drive up and drive back. And yeah. occasionally you get a Tuesday, Wednesday double, not very often. But I did it and I managed to get that done in uh, 14 months. So I finished the rest of the ones I needed by uh, October 89. So it was like, oh. great, I've done it. I've done the Scottish ones. And now it's just, and I think it's a case with most hoppers, every time there's a new ground or every time a new team comes in, then that's, you've got to go and do that new ground. So in Scotland, we've had like East Fife, we've had Clyde. Uh, I missed the old St. Johnston, which was like one of my disappointments in, in the ground hopping side. Didn't get to the old St. Johnston ground. Didn't get to old Newport County ground, which I would have loved to have done. But it was a case of like, do the, the 38 Scottish and then top them up as new teams come in the league. And then it became logical then to get into non-league football because once I'd done the English and Scottish, the next ones, well, well, I've done all this now, let's get into the conference. And then when you do the conference, let's get to the one below. And I think I've tended to focus more, some ground hoppers will do, like they might do one in the north tonight and one in the south tomorrow or whatever. But I, if I get to, to want to finish a league, then I concentrate on that league and then when I finish the league, I move on to the next one. So with the conference, it was a case of like, well, which ones do I need? Which ones haven't gone down and so on that I've already done? And then try and get them sorted. Uh, so it is it is frightening to think how much I've spent on the road and how much money I've spent doing it. But it's something that I've enjoyed doing. It's a passion that I've got. And I'm still doing it now, like 30 years on, which is even worse, I guess. It's like we all say, it's, it's a never-ending hobby. Never it is, ending yeah. hobbies, so many the grounds don't go do. away, do they? They don't go away, and then it became oh. like a little bit in the my best mate moved to live in Milan in '92. Uh, so the logical thing was my first ground abroad's got to be San Siro, hasn't it? So, oh, yeah. well, it wasn't the first ground abroad actually because Everton played in the '85 Cup Winners' Cup final in Rotterdam, so I went to that. And that was my first ground abroad. And obviously winning a European trophy was like, you know, a dream well to, to, for my first game abroad. But then I went to the San Siro in 95, stayed with him for a few days. And then that opened up a load of other things. And again, at the end of the 90s, it was difficult to, to sort out trips abroad. It's not as easy as it is now, where we all know how to do our own flights and and sort of get tickets yeah. and so on. In the, the first two ones we did, we did uh, with a travel company in Manchester where we said we want to do Real Madrid and Barcelona. So they organised it. We picked a weekend where both were at home. They organised the flight. They organised the tickets. We paid an absolute fortune for it. But, you know, for us, it was brilliant. We got to two big grounds that we wanted to go to. And then the next one we did was in Lisbon where we did all four in one weekend. We, they were all at home the same weekend. Uh, we did that paid a fortune for that but that was I think the one where when we were there we realised we could get our own tickets you could go to the ticket office the day before and buy tickets and I think it was that point where we said right we're going to do our own we don't need a travel company to do this for us we can do our own and as more and more low-cost airlines sort of came out it was a case of well yeah we can boot to get to these places we'll take a chance on tickets it's backfired a couple of times. We've gone to places and not got into games, but we've now, me, one of my mates from Bristol, we do, uh, I think in, until COVID times, we've done a trip abroad, at least one trip abroad for 20 odd years. And I think I'm up to about 500 grounds abroad now, where I've seen different grounds or games at different grounds when we've we've flown the, flown the continent as such. So it's like, it's something I enjoy doing, but bizarrely, I haven't done a ground abroad since before COVID. The last one I did was in March 2020, and um, for a number of reasons, I've not done another one since, but it's on the agenda. We'll get back at some point. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> but March so 2020, as you say, as you say it's, something 
that's never ending. Like, you know, you can look, you, you can have a list of ones at home, you can have a list of ones abroad. And it's always, yeah, I want to go there and I want to do this and I want to do that. And it's good that you can go to places where you've never been or probably wouldn't even think of going to, to get to a new ground. Yeah. And it happens, it, it happens when we've gone to places and thought, it's lovely here, we'll come back again some other time and do another game somewhere else nearby. So yeah, Absolutely. You never know what you're going to get, do you? You don't. So I've done the ground hopping probably since 87. And then the last couple of years from... Uh, when we went into lockdown, I did a lot of scouting and opposition analysis courses online. So I'm now doing a little bit more where I go to games during the midweek at home, similar to yourself, where you go to games locally. So I might go to a game now, I might watch Bootle on Tuesday, I might watch Lytham and Remaker on Wednesday. And to me, it's like you're just going and watching the game, but you're also talking to other people who are there, different people who you see all the time at, you know, at ground up at local games. Whereas I thought if I do the scouting, then that's another purpose for going to a game. So I'm not just going to stand at the game and have a chat with a few people or if there's no one there, stand on my own. I'm actually going with a purpose now where I'm actually looking at a player, looking at a team, looking at formations and then reporting them back. So I actually feel I'm not doing it every game, but when I do that, it's a little bit different to just standing there and chatting with people and catching up on what ground you've been to and what ones you're going to next. So I've been doing that for like one or two years now, or two years. So it's going okay. Yeah, that's good. Is it, is it for a certain club? Yeah, there was, last season I was doing it for Kings Lynn. So I was like the northern, okay. the northwest sort of representative for Kings Lynn. So I'd watch games in the northwest and report back on them. So it might be opposition. So if they were playing Wrexham or they were playing Altrincham, I'd go and watch them and then report back. Or they might send me specifically to look at a player. So uh, there was one time I went to FC United and watched a player. Well, twice, actually, I went to FC United and watched a specific player for them. But for me, I thought it was a, a bit of a thankless task because I think a lot of non-league clubs now think they're going to get a Jamie Vardy, that you're suddenly going to find this guy who's going to be brilliant. But I'm yeah. thinking, like, from my point of view, if I find somebody good playing for Uncorn, what's the chances of them going to Kings Lynn? Because it's like a conference club, but you've got to move house, you've got to change your job. And unless yeah. you're going to be definitely going to be playing and you're like a brilliant player as such, the chances are a lot of people aren't going to make that move. You're going to make the move more locally than you would do to into Norfolk. So I was finding like I'd find a good player for Runcorn and then when Kings Lynn would speak to him, he just didn't want to think about moving down into like Norfolk and anyway. So I was doing it for them last season. I did a couple of Northwest Counties clubs as well, because again, it's easy to go and watch Northwest Counties games and turn a report around quickly. And But like the guy that mentored me in the, the course is saying like, well, that's not proper football. That's guys who are painters and decorators and gardeners and plumbers and electricians. <laughs> you want to go and do it for a proper club. But I know myself that you've got to get build up a CV. You've got to build up a portfolio. Because I can't go to Akron and Stanley and say, this is what I can do, unless I've actually got the physical reports and evidence. And until you do that, you, you're not going to get a job with a club. So I've got to sort of learn, work my way up first. Which That's is a fair point, yeah. Yeah, but I like doing it in my spare time, but I'm never going to jack in going to Everton. So if I got a job at Accrington and they said to me on a Saturday, yeah, I'll go and watch a player wherever, and Everton are playing, and I'm going to have a, an issue there, aren't I? Because I'm, yeah. I'm not going to want to miss an Everton game. So I think it's more of a part-time and a more of a, a hobby type thing to do. But obviously helping non-league clubs, which might help them win games and, you know, going forward, bringing players for them. No, absolutely. It's a good thing for uh, for the communities of these clubs. Um, yeah. I mean, you ever been to a game as a scout to look at a player, but actually your attention has been on a different player? Yeah. Does that happen yeah. a lot? It does happen, yeah. You go to watch a specific player and that player might not have a good game. They might not do what you'd expect them to do, but then someone else is standing out. So I would go back and say, well, actually, I went to watch player X and player Y was fantastic, and this is what player Y did. So you'd still do your report on player X because that's what you've been asked to do, but then you'd supply info as well on player Y, and then it's up to them what they do with it then. So that's what I've been doing this season, to be honest. I've, I've got an open book at the minute where I went to, with some of your uh, mates the other week, we went to Leeds, Norwich, and I thought Arch in under 21, and I had an open book. They played on a Monday afternoon, and the open book was go and watch the game and tell us what players stand out. 
and yeah. that's what I've done. So I'm not going there to watch John Smith. I'm going there to say which players are good or which players stood out on the day. And then it's up to the club then to either send somebody else to get a second opinion or they then follow it up with the player or the agent or whatever. I don't do any of that type of stuff. I'm just watching the players and, and recommending which players are, are standing out or doing well. Simple. To, I'm, I'm sure you probably prefer that, don't you, going... I can, yeah. I can imagine that being a lot more relaxing and easier rather than the player camp. It's easy because you don't you you're watching and if a player is standing out at the first twenty minutes, you then tend to focus on that player a little bit more. But I yeah. like doing the opposition analysis as well because what that involves is you have to look at every single player, see what their strengths and weaknesses are, and and what they do, where they play, positional side. But then you'd have to do uh, how they attack and defend free kicks, the team, and how they attack and defend corners. So you're watching eleven players. The difficult one last season was sometimes King's Lynn would say to me, go and watch four different players, two from each team, and here they are. And like one would be a centre-back for one team, a centre-back for the other team. So your eyes are trying to be all over the pitch at the same time because you've got to watch what they do off the ball as what they do on the yeah. ball because that's important as well, like attitude and, and how they actually focused and so on. So, yeah, it's getting there. It's a, it's a, it's a big learning thing, but learning care, but hopefully I'll get there at some point. No, no, so far, so good. I mean, and if I try, to, try to sort that with me ground hopping as well. If I can, <laughs> yeah. like the, the, the game of Thorpe Arch the other week was brilliant for me because go to Thorpe Arch and oh, actually, I haven't been there. That's another one. I'll take off. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. No, no, it's a good way of getting around. I was going to ask have you, have you had any successes with Kingsland yet? No, you, you've what, been, you recommended any player. I've recommended a couple of players, and they are. I mean, without being critical here, they had 17 guys like me last year who were doing it. Uh, not, none of us were getting paid for anything. We were just getting tickets into games. And between us all, we, we recommended quite a few players. But they had two different managers. The first manager, up until the end of October, uh, I don't know what he did. Obviously, I wasn't the chief scout, so we, our reports went off. And then he changed the manager who then brought in his own scouting setup, who he, guys he'd worked with before. And you can understand that if it's guys that you trust, then you want to work with them. So he still kept us working in the background. But then at the end of the season, they decided to let us all go. So, you know, the 17 guys there who were doing a job for nothing giving information around the country that they decided to dispense with. But again, they dropped from the conference to conference north. So it's not as if it's the paying us. So it's, there's, a, there's money involved. They just decided that's the way they wanted to go forward. And I think that happens in life as well. I mean, you know yourself, if you're in a job, you've got people, you turn out people around you who you can trust than people you don't know. So nobody knows whether my opinion of a player is, is the same as somebody else's. So that's the idea of why two or three different scouts would go and watch the player to make sure that we all had the same opinion or we, we all saw the same things. So, yeah, it was, a, it was a little bit difficult. But at the end, as I say, at the end of the season, they decided to, to dispense with all of our services and uh, we're not doing it now. But that's the way things go, isn't it? There's it is, mate, yeah. Fun. But uh, I'm sure they are. Obviously, other clubs would be happy to take you, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's where LinkedIn comes in. You try and get something through LinkedIn and tell them yeah. what people know what you can do. And again, I worked with 17 guys at King's Lynn and they all know, we all know what we were doing. We could all see each other's reports. We'd all bouncing off each other. I'd see a player in the Northwest and the guy in the Northeast would go and watch them when they were playing up there. So we were working together. So yeah, it was a case of networking and hopefully then finding something else after that. No, no, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Scouting career goes on. So we'll, we'll see. <laughs> so I just want to ask, uh, uh, touch on Everton again. So yeah. relegation was close last year. Too close. How do you think they're going to go on this season? Uh, what I've seen so far, I mean, we've 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 struggled because we haven't had a proper striker with Calvert Lewin being injured, letting Richarlison go was a, like a big one to lose because he scored big goals for us at the end of last season. Uh, we brought in Mope. It's difficult to tell after one game. I don't think he had a brilliant game yesterday. He worked hard, but the two chances or the two half chances he had, he sort of bottled, if you like. Yeah. Now, hopefully, with a couple more games, he's going to get back into it a little bit. But the signs are a lot better than last season. We had a right mess of a team last season that was messed up by Benitez and those before him. And I don't think the 
the, the previous transfer policy was great either. But the players we brought in this season, like Tarkovsky and Cody, are both leaders. They both played for England. They play well together at the back. So um, hopefully that, that's going to work. Michelenko and Patterson, the two fullbacks, both came in late on last season, had a few games, but they've been very good this season. So that's promising. And then the midfield changes he brought in. Ghana Gay come on yesterday as if he'd never been away. And he's like in front of the back four, superb player. He can read the game. So there's hope. There was certainly hope from yesterday's game. Um, the other two, Onana, I've not seen much of Joe Garner at, uh, who would, at not Forest last season. I've not yeah. seen a great deal of him at all. But Onana's come in and he's he's not looking too bad either. So hopefully when they all gel and they've all had a few games together, we'll start putting some wins. But it's just a difficult start. Four, four points from six games. Arsenal away next weekend, not looking great. But, you know, once things, once we get that first win under the belt, I think we can move forward. But last season was awful. It was like, you know, you were, you were dreaming every game. Like, how many games have we got? How do we play? And how do you think that's going to go? It was like, you go to bed thinking about it. You'd wake up thinking about it. And I'm not the only one who's been in the team who's been relegated or whatever. But it was, like, dreadful to think, like, how things were going on that. Yeah, and I luckily, mean, luckily we escaped at the end. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask that. Did, did you go to that Crystal Palace game? Yeah, I think as games go, uh, that's possibly got to be down as one of my top three now. I had okay. like the Bayern Munich game in '85 was possibly my best ever game I'd been to. The atmosphere that night was unbelievable. Coming back from one nil down to to win and get to the final was absolutely brilliant. So that was probably my best ever game. And Wimbledon, again. It wasn't a great game, the Wimbledon game, when we beat them 3-2 to stay up in 94. But again, the consequences of it, had we lost that game, we'd have got relegated. So to come back from 2-0 down to win 3-2 was us had to be up there with the best. But the Palace one was, <clears throat> for the Wimbledon game, we had like decent players in the side, like Stode in Watson, Lundsworth, Southall. We had good players then. Last season, we didn't. Mm. So the longer it went on, the more it looked like we were going to be the ones to take the drop, especially when Burnley changed the manager and then started winning. Leeds, yeah. you never knew what was happening with Leeds. They'd like lose badly one week and then they'd go and win somewhere that you wouldn't expect them to win. Yeah. So the Palace game was brilliant because 2-0 down, everyone was despondent and we're thinking, well, we've only got one game left. It's Arsenal away. We're not going to get anything there. So we've got to win this one. Half-time, 2-0 down. Burnley were winning the Villa, so we were well and truly in the bottom three. And uh, to just turn it round, the, the, I mean, Michael Keane scored a worldy from sort of central defender to get it in from the way he did. A great knockback by Holgate and Keane buried it. And then Richarlison scuffed one in, and then you suddenly think, oh, the Wimbledon game, this is like, it's starting to think about similarities to that yeah. one. And uh, to then go and get the winning goal. I and mean, then the ironic thing is, Anthony Gordon used to take the set pieces and he'd always hit the first man or he'd always put it in the crowd. And he didn't. Damani Gray took it. And Damani Gray put it on Calvert Lewin's head, who hadn't played for about like the best part of four months. And like it was just to actually go 3 2 up and then think we're going to stay up if we win this game was absolutely like fabulous feeling so I think that's one of the things you think when you're talking about football it's you've got the despair of what it would have been to go down but the actual elation of that turning that game round and the way we turned it round to win 3-2 and then I went on the pitch at the end and I got loads of stick off people like hooligan going on the pitch and all that shit but it was <laughs> one of those that. where you just couldn't stop yeah. and not do it it was like it was such an emotional night to turn it round from where we were to where we got to and then to know that we were staying up when for the last three months we looked virtually certain to to go down. It was a brilliant turnaround. So yeah, that's yeah. possibly my favourite game. And I've been to why not? Yeah, yeah, I think it, it's got to be my favourite Everton game now. I mean, yeah. beating Liverpool is always one of the top ones, as you'd love to know that, which we don't win very often. But no, I think that one, just because of the circumstances, the way it turned round and the feeling at the end, that's possibly got to be like probably the best game I've been to from, from an Everton point of view. I know, fair play. There are always great when moments like that happen for yeah. whoever club, whichever club it is. But uh, I mean, I think Everton, that second longest spell in the Division 1, I mean, yeah. They had a few close calls, but I'm guessing that was probably the closest. 
Yeah, well, that on Wimbledon, and Coventry was like Coventry was funny in '98 as well because it was yeah. between us and Bolton, and yes. and again, I never really felt we'd go down that season, but we could have done because we drew with Coventry one or Bolton lost two another Chelsea, yeah. and Chelsea were in the European Cup Winners' Cup final the week after, and all the assumptions were that Chelsea were going to be on the beach and we're going to be bothered, and Bolton had like sort of win, and then we'd have to win, and in that. Again, that was how Kendall came back for a season and nearly took us down. No fault of his, of his really. Yeah. But we had some really bang average players in that team. And again, we were, I'm not saying we were lucky to stay up, but we stayed up on goal difference. That point made the difference. And then yeah. it's funny because in the first game of the season, we played both in the way and they had a goal disallowed, which their fans keep on going about, oh, well, if that goal had been given, it would have made a big difference. And obviously it would have done. But we yeah. felt at the time it was a foul on Southall and all of that stuff. But it was ironic that it ended up being those two teams that were in the fight. So I've seen it, I've seen us close three times, all going to the virtually the last day. And I don't want to be in that situation again. And I think we all said in 94, don't ever get in that situation again. We did it four years later and we've done it again. So, I mean, you know, nobody's nobody's too big to go down. And I think that was one of the things last season. Everyone, oh, Everton will go down, they're too big. It's nothing to do with that. It's how the players are on the pitch, how they're set up. And if the players aren't off for it. And I think the fans pulled us through as well because we had different sorts of ideas where they had this coach thing coming in where the, the coach was brought into the ground at a specific time and then the fans got on the road and cheered the coaching, which sounds a bit pathetic and so on, but the atmosphere it created before the game, it must have got the players up for it. It got, certainly got the fans up for it. And it, it sort of helped because we won two of them last three home games. Didn't help yesterday because we didn't win yesterday, but we'd had another <laughs> go at doing it yesterday. But it was like, you know, everyone played the part in a way to, to keep us up. And it's not often you can say that the fans sort of helped as well. Yeah, absolutely. They, they always do. I mean, you look, you look at, well, <laughs> I'm going to mention one club that you're not going to like, but Champions League Knights at Anfield is a yeah, saying yeah. that goes around. Yeah. Because of the fans. And same yeah. with Celtic as well. They're another club that do it yeah. really well. Everyone says that, that the uh, the Champions League at Anfield or the Knights at Anfield, are really, you can see me now. Everyone says <laughs> yeah, the, Knights are, the Knights, the European Knights at Anfield, I obviously haven't been to one, but everyone says that's like having a 12th man on the, on, on the pitch. Yeah. And I think that drags the players over the line as well. And Celtic, great Knights at Celtic as well. I have done a couple of those actually in the Argo. Oh, wow. So, I'd love to one day, definitely. You'll get there. But yeah, it, there are times like that where the fans do play a part. They do. I mean, it didn't help against Brentford. I mean, I remember that game quite well. He got you in the lead twice, but that, that I mean, remember obviously the pyros galore and everything, but I generally thought after that game, I thought they're, they're going down. Yeah. I, think, I thought Everton were going down. I don't know what you thought, but... Uh, yeah, well, I did, because that was, you know, that was... It was the game before, really. We had Watford away, and that was a gimme to me. Like, hmm. Watford had lost 11 at home in a row, and we, we had that as our game in hand. So even when we were, like, five points behind... I always thought, well, that Watford's a gimme. We've got to win that one. So that's three points. So happy days. And then we went to Watford and drew nil-nil. And people were going, oh, yeah, but it's a point gain. And I'm going, no, it's two lost. You've got to win games like that. And then I think Leicester went there the day after or the weekend after and beat them 5-1. And it was just like two points dropped. And then yeah. when we had Brentford at home, Leeds, I always remember walking to the ground, Leeds kicked off a two and we kicked off a four. Leeds yeah. were one nil down. And just as I was getting in the ground, Leeds equalised in the 94th minute. And that went from us needing a point to stay up to then needing three. And then we then had to be Brentford. And then the way that one went, and we ended up losing three two. I thought, well, Brentford at home, we beat them easy in the cup in January. So it was that was the one where I thought, well, that's the home game that we're going to win. And then we didn't. But it, then we wouldn't have had the great night against Palace if we'd have beat Brentford. I don't think it would have been as good beating Brentford as it was actually beating Palace. But you can't, I know you you can't like ask for that, but that's how it ended up being. But yeah, I thought after Brentford we were, we were done. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll have a close call this season? I'm, I'm hoping not. I think there's there's teams worse than us. And I think, as I touched on before, I think we've got the right type of players in now to move us forward. What we don't know is what we're going to do with injuries, what we're going to do with suspensions, how things are going to go. We don't know whether the, the manager will stay. You'll assume he will. But you never know with these type of things in football. You just don't know. Looking at, looking at it from the outside, Leicester don't look great. Uh, no. Nope. 
I mean, the fact that they've got no money, they've not brought any players in, they're really struggling. I think the manager's not happy. Uh, so they, they're they not looking great at all. Uh, Bournemouth have had a couple of terrible results, but brilliant win yesterday. So I don't know, there's like, there's teams down there and I would, I would not want us to be in that situation. But you just don't know, because I mean, you're hoping all these players that are going to come in and click, and they are good players, but you just don't know what the season is going to bring. You, you, we, lose, we, we take another couple of games where we don't win, and you never know what, what effects that's going to have. The longer we, we go without winning, then you know you don't want it to become the norm. Like, But it's one of those where you think, well, we've just got to get that win, and then I think we'll kick on from there. But injuries, suspensions, you just don't know. And if we lose Mope and Calvert-Lewin doesn't come back, we're down to three wingers up front again, which is none of them are a proper centre-forward which we might live to regret that, but let's hope we don't. Who knows? Well, I think that, that, that was, in the end, probably what cost Ronald Koeman in the end, if you remember. Obviously, Allardyce came in and brought in a striker. and Yeah. Well, Ronald him. Koeman had Lukaku, didn't he? And, like, Lukaku yeah. was... And then he sold Lukaku. And then we got money for him and then didn't properly replace him. No. And then, you know, we started with Marco Silva, which... Well, it was Allardyce, yeah, Allardyce after the Koeman, wasn't it? But see, yeah. I don't think Allardyce used Rooney properly. We brought Rooney back, and you've got a guy there who scored like 250 goals for Man U, 50 goals for England, and we play him in centre midfield. Mm -hmm. And like, if he'd have played up front with Calvert Lewin in that season, how much he would have passed on in terms of knowledge and experience yeah. to a young lad who was got potential, who eventually went to play on to play for England. Rooney and Calvert-Lewin could have been a good partnership, but he played him in midfield and his legs were starting to go. And I always remember one game that we played Man City at home, we were, who had, I can't think of what it was, it was like De Bruyne, Silva and Rodrigo, it might have been in midfield. And we played them against Rooney and Snyderlin. And you think, like, we're, no wonder we're 3-0 down at half-time, we're completely overrun. But I think in that Koeman and then Allardyce just didn't use him in the right position. I don't know why. There's obviously things go on that we don't see as fans. But I think we could have been a lot better that season had we we used him as a forward rather than sort of playing just behind. Because I think you'd remember as well, we signed Sigurdsson and uh, Klassen in the number 10 role and Mooney as well. So we had three number 10s and no sense forward. Mm, but yeah, Cenk Tossen as well, with either striker he brought yeah. in. He brought Allardyce brought him in, yeah, you're right. He brought Santos and then uh, again he wasn't really the answer. He had a couple of games he scored. I think he scored two or three goals. And but they were against Huddersfield and Fulham and West Brom or whatever. He yeah. never scored in a big game. And you know, 27 million we paid for him. We've had some horrendous transfer dealings where we paid shed loads of money for some players and let them go for next to nothing. Balassi, 28 million goes on free. Gilfie Sigurdsson, for whatever he did last season, 45 million goes on, he's, well, we get nothing for him. I mean, you could, the list is endless how much sure. money we've wasted on some players. The, we've just got next to nothing back from them going. And uh, yeah, you're right, since Lukaku, we haven't really had a proper striker. We've, mm -hmm. we've made do. Richarlison came as a left winger. And he, he ended up playing up front. We tried Moise Keane. Moise Keane didn't really work. Done well for Juventus and PSG and, and Italy. Didn't really work for us. So we have struggled since Lukaku went with all the goals that he scored. And we've just not replaced him. One of those things. I'm sure they will replace him eventually, but, uh, <laughs> but who knows? Uh, yeah, that's true. Let's hope so. Before, before, before we go on to ground, I just want to ask, I don't, some people don't really touch on it, like Derby days. Like obviously, what, what's it like on a Merseyside Derby? I mean, <laughs> don't worry about the result. <laughs> we'll get to that, but what's it, no, don't what's it like it. being a Merseyside Derby? Uh, brilliant both grounds, by the way. Say again, at both grounds. At, at both, yeah, Anfield and Goodison, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is a really good atmosphere. Going back to the 80s when I first, or well, 70s and 80s when I first started going, you get to a point where when we played at Anfield, Everton fans would be in the cop. So it was a time when, what they used to do was, uh, season tickets, obviously, season ticket holders went first and got their tickets. And then what they'd do was they'd put all the other tickets on, like, a general sale issue, and they'd issue vouchers. So you try and get an idea what game they were going to issue vouchers for. So if Liverpool were playing Everton in March, the games in February, they would give out a voucher for people paying in. So you'd have Everton fans that go and pay in and then walk back out to get the voucher. 
So we then ended up, with, and they did it with us as well, because we had the similar situation. So in the 80s, we would, if we got tickets on the cop, so if you didn't get them in, in, in the normal Everton end, we'd go on the cop, and you'd stand on the cop and it would be fine. I mean, yeah. obviously there was banter, obviously there was like stick going on, but you'd never have like full scale battles or anything like that. No. And it was just accepted that if we played around field and Everton fans were in the cop, everyone would gather together and be on the left hand side of the cop. When they were in our place and they were at the front of the Gladys Street, they would create this gap and their fans would be at the front of the Gladys. And you might get things thrown and stuff like that, but it would never be like a massive kickoff or a massive problem that you might get some grounds. It's sort of, it was it was like a friendly atmosphere, but they wanted to beat us and we wanted to beat yeah. them. But, you know, you got involved in it. Uh, we had some bad ones in the 80s, obviously they beat us in the League Cup final. So the first time we got to Wembley for years, it would be against Liverpool and we managed to lose it. Then they beat us to do the double in 86, which is even worse. And in those days you had mixed coaches, so you'd get on the coach in town and it would be like the first 50 people on the coach and you'd sit down and they'd half for blues, half for reds. So you didn't, if that coach wasn't blue and that one wasn't red. You'd actually mix it up because it was accepted then that there'd be no massive problems. And then we obviously lost in 89 cup final as well. So it felt as if every time we played in the cup final, it had to be against Liverpool and we'd end up coming off worse at the end of it. So in the 80s, it, it was... It was a good friendly sort of rivalry and, and the, the atmosphere at the games were brilliant. I mean, it was great being on the cop where you could stand up and you were getting pushed forward and backwards and whatever. I think the first time I ever went on the cop, I had a couple of chocolate bars in my pocket, being massively naive about this, stood behind a crash barrier, went to get them out at half time to eat them and they were just crumbs because I'd been rammed into the barrier so much <laughs> that the chocolate bars just didn't exist anymore. And then home games again, you'd have them in the, in the street end and you just watch the game. And if they scored, fine, give them a bit of stick. But it was never, never like any hassle. There was never kickoffs or anything like that. And then it became a bit different when we went to seats because you were then physically in a seat. So I remember going into a game in Anfield in the upper Anfield Road in the wrong section. And we scored in the first minute. And I went in the ground and thought, what I don't want to do here is jump up if we score and get lobbed out. Because it then started, when you were in seats, it became like... You were you were obvious if you were on your own, you were sort of more of a target if you like, and we scored yeah. in the first minute at Anfield, and I thought, oh shit, I can't jump up here because I'm going to get logged out in the first minute, and then I looked round and a few others had jumped up, so you, I sort of went up. It didn't seem as right at the time after a few seconds and whatever, but it was like you then started to get a bit more hassle because people who were in the group of like 15 around you, suddenly this one guy on his own who supported Everton, you'd start getting like a lot of like stick and, and grief and so on. So it became a little bit more nasty, if you like, without yeah. being really bad. It become like, well, do you really want to jump up and make yourself known? Because you're going to have to sit there for the rest of the game, either get thrown out or you'll start getting like stick off the the other people around you so it's it's not been as great since we've been in seats but thankfully i think for about the last 20 years i think i've had a ticket in the everton end for anfield yeah. so walking up to the ground it seems it's it's generally okay but we've we've had a bit of like sort of since what happened with Heisel and stuff and mm. we ended up lose, losing our chance to play in Europe and so on. There's been a little bit of tension between the two sets of fans and so yeah. over that. And then I think it's now the case of like they've been winning a lot more than us in the past. It's like if we win, we've won the World Cup because in their eyes. And I think over time, Liverpool fans will probably say that they look at Man United more as a rival to them than they might do with Everton. But for yeah. us, like obviously our main rival is Liverpool and the two fixtures you always look for when the fixtures come out. And I'm not saying it's the two that you desperately want to win, but you know, if winning the derby is brilliant. It's such a, a great feeling to win the derby, but not so I can say of, I can remember it too well from last time. But it's great to win a derby, but most of the time, the, the sets of fans are fine. But there are occasions where it will burst over, as it probably yeah. will do in a lot of a lot of derbies or big games. But it is an enjoyable game to go. I love going to the one of because I've got a great seat. I sit behind the goal. The away fans are to me right, so I can hear what's getting said, and I can get all the, the banter between the two lots. And then when we go to Anfield, it's again, it's good because you feel as if like you know I'm in my own city. We're playing yeah. at their place. We want to turn them over at their place. 
not that we very do very often but when we do it's it's even much more enjoyable and then you're giving stick to their fans and they're giving you stick back so it's great it's possibly the one game of the two games i don't say i like going to them because a lot of people don't go you know a lot of everton fans won't go to anfield and there's a you know, i had a couple of mates yesterday who wouldn't even go to the home game because they just said it's too tension they don't like derby games and they'd sooner just not be there but I don't think I could never be there for the derby. When we were in COVID times, I hated it. Not being able to be at the ground when the game was on the TV. It was just didn't feel right. No, it's a very good point, obviously. <laughs> and you beat us as well. That, that didn't well help. Yeah, the one game I couldn't go to. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that's amazing, that. like Especially, you know, because I say this to people, obviously, I know a lot of United and Wednesday fans where yeah. I live. It's like, we live, we work alongside each other yeah but yet we want to kill each other on the, on that on the derby day and then we've got Liverpool ever had sat next to each other in the I think that's amazing me I mean it I've is, seen it is I've good. seen United and Wednesday fans try and kill each other literally on derby yeah. days I know um, it's never yeah. been like that I mean I've, I've obviously got a lot of mates who are Liverpool fans and you never even dream of like having a kick off with them or yeah. you know sort of falling out with them you you fall out over the match and like we'll be probably saying now we had a disallowed goal yesterday that should have stood and we would have won and all of that. But you know, you'd have that type of banter with them. But you never get to the point where it's like massive hatred. And I remember going on holiday once in the 80s with my mate, and there was two lads who were Tottenham and Arsenal fans, and we said, What's it like in a derby? And he said, If Arsenal beat Tottenham, I'd actually kick shit out of him. And I said, No, you wouldn't. He's your mate. No, he said, seriously, I would. He said, like, that's how it is. He said, like, we absolutely, on Derby Day, we hate each other. And he said, if I see him after the match and we've won or whatever, or we've lost, he said, like, I wouldn't dream of, of not hitting him. And I'm going, you can't. You can't. It's not like that. But that's what they said it was like. And as you've said, you know, Burnley and Blackburn, they get bust in. Burnley and Blackburn to their own because they probably, I mean, I've been to those games, but I've not been in a situation where they've mixed. But they obviously hate each other to an extent. The, they couldn't be allowed to mix. And it's like, yeah. there's a few of them like that, isn't there? I think Wrexham and Chester to a lower level, it's on a bus. I yeah. don't know what it's like with Celtic and Rangers. I think, don't they only get like 800 tickets or something now? For yeah, I think, well, I, I mean, I know a few Celtic fans who said that, the, you know, the, 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 both clubs have killed it for each other on away days because it's, it's literally like 1,000 maximum. I don't think it's now, I think 700, 800, I think, yeah, like you say. Yeah, 800, isn't it? Which just takes the atmosphere out of it, doesn't it? You've got to have it does. three thousand away fans there to to give the the game a little bit of atmosphere as well from yeah, the it, from the support. They used to give each other five thousand, I believe. Yeah. I mean, Celtic got that whole end when they used to go both used tiers. To get the bottom, didn't they? And then the Rangers fans at Celtic Park got the corner, but obviously two but tiers again, like a bit, yeah, right? yeah. Um, but apart, apart from what I've been told, apparently, uh, I think Rangers destroyed the toilets in their end at Celtic Park and then Celtic fans did the same at Rangers because they did it and I think that was when it was both clubs said right we're shortening your uh, your allocation your allocation yeah I mean it's it's never come to that with us we have got a couple of mindless idiots I mean we had some yesterday where apparently a couple of the Liverpool uh, statues were defaced or had stickers put on them we had a couple of ours where we've got like a mural outside the ground with all people on like bricks and stuff and they stuck things on that which like there's always going to be people like that who, and, you know, the people are saying, oh, there's not proper supporters and that. And it's, you know, the type of normal people who go to games aren't going to do that. But there'll be some people who will get to that point and, and do stuff. But most of the time, a, a Merseyside derby is a good one to go to. And mates who come who are neutral, you'll have to get a ticket at some point. You'll you'll feel what it, well, you're not a neutral anyway. But you'd have to feel what it was like and feel the atmosphere and, and you know, get into it. Yeah, I'd love to one day, mate, brilliant. absolutely. Um, I've just got to touch on uh, Goodison Park. I mean, the end the end is near. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Well, I don't know whether you know, but I actually did my thousands game at Goodison last season. Uh, when, we played Arsenal, in, when we played Arsenal in December, uh, that was my thousands game at Goodison. Not wow. all Everton games, because I've done, like, there's been a couple of internationals there. I've done yeah. reserve games, youth games, and so on. So it was a thousands game. Uh, it's what I've called home for the last 50 odd years. So it's going to be mad going somewhere else. So, I mean, Goodison's a great ground. Like, you know, yeah. for a way fan, it's not great because you sat in the corner. Uh, people complain about the posts and I've, I've experienced the posts as well. We had a great one one year. We played a friendly 
uh, against Villarreal. And I had to get 10 tickets for like different mates. We said, we'd all sit together. All of us who don't normally sit together, we'll go in one spot for this because it's a friendly, we'll change stands and sit somewhere different. And took my dad as well, which was great for him to go. I dished out all the tickets. We were on the front row of the Bullen stand. Dished out all the tickets. When I got in, I was right behind the post. I couldn't even see the... I, couldn't even, I was oh, like that, wow. trying to watch the game. So I understand the ground is dated. It's yeah. like, you know, there's... In the Bullens Road stand, it's wooden floor. So, I mean, we've had issues with wooden floors in the past at different grounds, which aren't great. And uh, it's dated, and I, I get that. And if you want to move on with the times, you've got to go to something better. Uh, we've fallen behind, and it's, we're not the only team, but we've fallen behind with the corporate. So we've got 12 executive boxes that hold 10 people. You've got, I think, Man United have got something like 250. So the amount of money they're getting in, I mean, obviously they've got a bigger capacity crowd anyway, but the amount yeah. of extra money they're getting in for every game from a corporate customer uh, people will pay corporate, you know, yourself. I mean, the, the likes of me and you will probably want to be on the terraces, but there yeah. will be other people who want to do the corporate thing and who want yeah. to get the, the prawn sandwiches and sit in a posh seat and not have to stand up in a queue outside and everything. There will be that. And we've massively fallen behind by the revenue that we've lost by not having that corporate option. So I think the thing with Goodison is, like, the night games are a great atmosphere. If you go to a night game and it's against a decent side, it will be good as an under lights, we always say, is a really good atmosphere. Wish we'd play more night games, but we don't. But it's, I'm going to miss it, obviously. It'll yeah. be weird driving past a spot that you've seen the ground after 50 odd years and suddenly there'll be something else there. But you, I guess we've got to move on with the times and the plans for Bramley Moor look really good. Uh, the ground has come up massively in the last few weeks. I mean, I've gone down and like driven past it a few times and looked at the progress and they've obviously had to fill the dock in to start with and that took a lot of time. Uh, they've done all the sort of all the other things they've needed to do to get it ready to go. But when you go past now, the rake of the stand is up on one side and it looks great. And um, the, the, river, the location on the edge of the Mersey, all the ships coming into Liverpool and going out have got to go past that stadium. And yeah. hopefully it's going to look brilliant going forward. I don't know where we're all going to stick, as they've ever said, how they're going to do it in terms of which stands we're going to get choice in and so on. Will the people yeah. who sit behind the goal now get fair shout and sit behind the goal in the new ground? I don't know. But I think Goodison is probably, as much as I don't like saying it, has probably come near to the end of its time if you want to move forward. It's obviously yeah. been there a long time and it's been a, like, you know, a, an iconic ground to to Evertonians and to a lot of other people as well. But I suppose if you want to move on, then we move on. And there's a lot of teams, you look at the team in the top division now, Arsenal, Tottenham, Man City, the ones who've got new grounds, they're still doing well on the pitch and they're still filling those grounds. What we'll do with the, whether we fill the 50 odd thousand every week, who knows, hopefully there are a lot of Evertonians who've stopped going might come back to games and we might, we might fill it. And it would be good if we did and we can get a good atmosphere. But the location really does look good, right on the edge of the yeah. river. It looks a cracking location. So we'll, we'll see. Will it, will, it, will it not make it a bit cold, though? I can imagine the winter, it might be a bit cold, yeah. Winter nights in December might be a bit more layers than normal, but yeah, yeah. who knows? And uh, you don't know what you're going to do if you have problems with the wave fans and anyone ends up in the water. It might be even colder then. No, you beat me to that one. What if, you know, Merseyside derbies, someone gets thrown in, you know? Yeah. Well, I can't wait to find out the, which game the first one will end up in the dock. I think when I've seen the plans of it, there's only one entrance in from what I can see. And the away fans are in that spot right there. So that means that all the home fans who go in, are gonna, they're going to have to walk past the away fans. or yeah, So yeah. I don't know how they're going to do it. Don't know where they're going to have coaches and so on. Yeah. But you can imagine a feisty game. I mean, if you've got somebody big in the FA Cup from a lower division, won't mention any names, I can imagine that would be quite interesting. We always yeah, have not, not, not just Not just thrown into the water violently, but what if, like, you know, you, 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 let's say you beat Liverpool. Yeah. What, on a, on a, it's, it's, it's a really warm day. What if someone could takes a shot jumps in? Could you imagine that yesterday? A lovely day yesterday, sun shining. How many people will end up in the water? It'd be like going in the fountain at Trafalgar Square, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But, uh, I think we'd have to find out how deep it is first and what the way out is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, this is the bit I want to talk to you about, round up okay. again. So, how many grams do you want now? Uh, 
don't know for definite, but it's about 3,100. I'm not up to date with my footballogy, to be honest, because there's grounds that need to go on it that haven't been added yeah. yet. And I'm a bit hopeless. I don't have games as a go every day. So I've, I'm a bit behind with doing my footballogy update. But on footballogy, I'm on 2,900, but I think I'm about another couple of hundred that need to go on. So, yeah, about 3,100 in total. Sounds a bit oh. mad, but yeah. Nowhere near some of the big hop, big hoppers, like with much more than that. But yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, well, certainly. I think that's probably a record for this podcast. I think anyone who's had that many grounds. Right, okay. Um, obviously, I know people who have done, I there's think uh, Dave, David Bunnings, I think, has done the most. 7,000, I believe. 7 or 8,000 he's done, yeah. There's, yeah, a, there's yeah. a few people who've done more than me, and uh, like, that's fine, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's good. But, I mean, Lawrence yeah. Reed, he was at 2,400 at the time. Uh, yeah. Chris Barrows, I, 1,700. Vaughan, 1,700. Yeah. So, yeah, crazy yeah. one. It's a lot. I mean, it's, you know, I've got to try and fit it in with, with going to Everton as well. Yeah. Uh, but I'm in a situation now where I can't do a new ground in midweek in the floodlit season. So, like, my nearest new ground would be south of Birmingham or probably up as far as Newcastle. So, if I'm working, then you can't go there midweek. So, I try and do those type of grounds at weekends if I can yeah. do. Um, and then watch, like, the local sides during midweek and give some sort of support to the local sides I'm doing the scouting bit as well but yeah it's uh, Saturdays for me are the ones where I've got to go to try and get the furthest ones in because I can't do it midweek unless I stay over which then you start to add into the cost then isn't it but it's start I got to the point where I think I did the is I finished the Isthmian League about 10 years ago and new teams have come and gone but then you look at it and the other hoppers that you've had on them know exactly the same thing for me to go to a game in Essex you're looking at about ninety pound in petrol, so you're looking know, at ninety pound yeah. in petrol for just one game, and it starts not really making financial sense to do that. No, so you've got to try and do a Friday night game, but then if you do a Friday night game, you've got accommodation as well. So then yeah. whatever you're saving, getting another ground in, you're spending on accommodation. So you've got to do try and do trips where you can get more than one game. In. And and we all know about bank holidays and so on, where you can try and do doubles and trebles. That's one of the things it's, I mean, one of the things with ground hopping is it's planning, isn't it? So you've yeah. got to look at where I'm going to do it. And I think one of the things you might touch on, I finished the Highland League the other week. And uh, I went up at the start of July, seeing the fixtures. I was off work for a week. And I needed five Highland League grounds. And when I looked at the fixtures for a week in July, four of the teams were at home. So I thought, well, that's a no-brainer. Got to do it because I can knock four off. Uh, there was other games as well. And yet it cost a lot of money in petrol because I did loads of miles while I was up there. <clears throat> but to go there once to do four grounds is like, is, is you know, Winner. you've got to do it because it's a long you way. You win. And it's a fortune. That, yeah, so it's a definite win. So I did four in July, which left me with Wick, <clears throat> which is like, it would be the furthest one away and, and so on. So my thoughts on Wick was, well, I didn't want to do it in the winter because I don't want to have to try, travel up the A9 in October, November, December. Plus you've got the chance of games getting called off. Plus yep. you've got the chance of getting stranded somewhere. So my view was, I've got to do it in the summer. Um, or I've got to do it in the, the nicer weather, if you like. Yeah. And then the week before, which was, I thought, well, I'll do it in August. And then the week before, we had that rain on that Tuesday night, and I think Forest Green was was postponed against Accrington. And there's me thinking, I was going to do Wick in August, because the weather's all right, and you get yeah. postponed games in Gloucestershire. So anyway, the view was, of my my own view was, I've got to do it in the, in the nicer weather. And they had a Wednesday night game last week, and I think my first Saturday off with Everton's the end of September. So I thought, now I've got to do it in August. So I made some ridiculous journey and went up on went up after the Fleetwood game on Tuesday night because I was meant to go Tuesday morning. But then Everton drew Fleetwood in the cup where I'd never seen us play before. So yeah. I had to do that. So I ended up going there and back Wednesday and Thursday. So it was like the best part of 2,000 miles to do one ground, which, which in ground hoppers terms is not a very good idea. But it was one of those, I've got to do it. And I've done it, so I've got it out of the way. But uh, it was my man. It's that Lawrence Reese says, though, we are all mad. Whatever we say, we are all mad yeah, as ground uppers. Definitely, yeah. People, I mean, I think, you know, you get stuck as a ground upper, but other people collect stamps. People, yeah. you know, collect stamps. Other guys go and stand on the railway and watch trains or write down train numbers, plane numbers or whatever. We've all got, like, oddities about ourselves and so on. And ground uppers are different. So, yeah, I mean... 
you know, driving up to, to Wick on a Wednesday and back on a Thursday to do one ground and do nearly like 2,000 miles. And it was a terrible game as well. It was a 1 0 win. It's awful. All oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Did you get your money's worth then? Yeah, but it's, yeah, I think I, it's around about 3,100. I, I think I'm on about 500 and something in abroad now as well. So that's included in that total. I wonder how many demolished ones are in there as well. Yeah, it's a good question. Though, actually, it's probably about well, I don't know off the top of my head. There's about forty in England, isn't there? There's a yep. few in Scotland, so I don't know whether there'd be more than a hundred, possibly seventy or eighty. Mm -hmm. oh, fair play. I mean, and, 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 is there any standout grounds in the Highland League? I think obviously I know Wick, Thurso, uh, Fort William, John right, Grounds. Well, but... it's funny you should say that Thurso aren't in the Highland League; they're in the North Caledonian, okay. so they're not even in it. Uh, right. Fort William were last year, but then they got. Uh, relegated yeah. after the yeah so I've not done Fort William that's one of the ones on the agenda okay so I think when I do Fort William I think I'd like to get to Glasgow by tra uh, by car and then go on the train the rest of it because it's supposed yeah. to be a really scenic route but there's some that are really good Fraserburgh I don't know whether you've seen pictures of Fraserburgh but that's right on the coast stand yeah. and then a church next to it so the okay. church is a bit of an iconic thing in the ground uh, Huntley's a decent ground Keith's yeah. decent uh, Inviori Locos, I like the name of that one. So I thought, like, I've got to go to Inviori Locos. I've never heard of that one before. Um, and that was like, that's not a bad little ground as well. And then some of them are just in the middle of nowhere. I went to Four Martin, and there's not even a place called Farm, Four Martin, as far as I'm aware. They played in, a, in another, uh, another place called something else. And ground was just in the middle of the countryside. And you're thinking, how have they got a team in the Highland League? Wick's a funny one. Wick's like a public park. So the ground is always open. You can go in and play on the pitch if you want on a yeah. like a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, but there are some decent ones up there. Yeah, some decent grounds to go to. So I mean, I think the first one I did was in '94 when I did Inverness Caledonian came into the league, and I got like a bonus game at uh, twelve o'clock on the Saturday. There was a game at Inverness Clapham Cuddens ground, and in those days you didn't have internet, you didn't have like phones or anything. And I'd been there for like three days because I did Ross on Wednesday and Inverness on the Saturday because they both came into the league at the same time. And then as I'd gone over to have a look at Inverness, Clack McCudden's ground on the Friday, there's a note up to say game at 12 o'clock Saturday. A local cup final. So I thought, oh, happy days, I'm going to do another wow. ground. So between going there in 94 and then going to, I went to Cove when Cove came into the league to, to do up my Scottish grounds. Um, and stayed up and did Inviori Locos the night before. It was 25 years between doing my first and second one. And then once I did Inviori Locos, it was a case of, right, I want to do this. This is a league that I want to finish, albeit it's miles away. And I got like a couple of really lucky weekends. We got one weekend where we got a Friday, Saturday, Sunday game. There was a Friday game move for the league and there was a Sunday cup final that I found out about. So I had to do that. There was another one where I got three in one weekend where I flew up. Uh, flew to Aberdeen and hired a car from Aberdeen and got three grounds in. And then, as I say, the one I did in July, I got four in in one trip. So suddenly, you, you're nearly there. But yeah. it's a hell of a way to go for one ground. <laughs> I bet it is. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, I imagine this is going to be a difficult question for you, but I'm going okay. to ask. 3,100, what are the best ones? Well, best ones I'm going to, obviously, is too many to choose. Yeah. Three yeah. favourites. I mean, obviously, I, I look at Goodison as the, my favourite one, but obviously that's yeah. not everybody's favourite one. And you can easily say Barcelona, Real Madrid, Milan, because, you know, they're big and everyone loves them. But I think the best grounds to go to for guys who haven't done it or who want to go and sample the experience, I think the top level in Germany is really good because okay. the grounds are good. They're all in, like, local... Or they're all in, like, parks where there's other things there as well. Yeah. Uh, the, the seats aren't rammed close together. You get, like, food and drink. You can easily... You can walk into the ground with a pint and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, the atmosphere tends to be good. Fans mix. We couldn't believe it. We went to Eintracht Frankfurt against Dortmund. And we had Dortmund fans in the, in the main stand and we're thinking, oh... How have they gone in here? But the, there wasn't any bother. They'd obviously bought tickets like we did. And they yeah. were just sat there, watched the game. They had the colours on. Nobody bothered about it. And I think there's like, when you when I think back, I think the, the ground that I really liked the best was Dortmund because they've okay. got the big wall at one end, you know. About, yeah. But the atmosphere at Dortmund was brilliant as well. 
Um, I think the game I saw probably helped. It was a big game and it was a really good atmosphere. But I think the fact that you could walk to the ground from the city centre, it's not like one of these that's miles out of town and you've got to get a bus or a train. Dortmund was good. I like Schalke. I mean, yep. they've gone on to bad things at the minute. I think they're like relegated yeah. and so on. Hamburg's a great ground and they're in second division. So I think if there's somebody who's going to sample Europe for the first time, Germany's like a good one to go to. Obviously, mm -hmm. pick your games. Don't like yeah. St. Pauli against uh, Hansa Rostock or somewhere like that where you might have a problem. But, you know, any of those games in the top division. Bayern Munich's a bit of a funny one because, obviously, it's a funny atmosphere because they're, they're always winning and they expect to win. But when yeah. you go to those other grounds, the Frankfurt, the Dortmunds, the Schalkers, the Hamburgs, Kaiser Lampen was a good one as well. Yeah. There's a lot of them where they're decent atmospheres and they're, they're good for fans to go to as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of people speak about Joe. Uh, Vaughan, he spoke about Germany very highly. Uh, yeah. Chris Turn Turnit Blade also mentioned VFL Bochum was a very good one. Yeah, well, I like I mean. Bochum as well. Yeah, I've seen them in yeah. the second division, but that was a good one. In fact, I've seen Bochum play that at uh, Bruce Dortmund. They were in the top division at the time. And it was a derby about 20 minutes apart. And yeah. we had tickets in the Dortmund and somebody had got us them. And that was 5-3 to Dortmund. Brilliant game, wow. but a really good atmosphere. Didn't see any bother after the game or anything. It was like, it was a decent, you know, a decent game to go to. But I also like going to Spain because I like the lower division ones in Spain where you've got like one stand, three open sides, and yeah. then apartments overlooking the ground. I like that type of feeling as well. And obviously if it's sunny as well, it's even yeah. better. But there's some decent ones in Spain. I mean, one of the problems, Probably a lot of people haven't been to a sport in Hihon. And I, I yep. really like that. It was a cracking atmosphere. Wow. All the way through, they sang and got behind the team. They were near the bottom of the table. They've been up and down between the two divisions. But a really good atmosphere. At that, you know, That's one of the ones that I remember. And you remember those type of ones with a good atmosphere rather than the more plasticky ones like Barcelona and Real Madrid where, you know, <laughs> the grounds look great, but the atmosphere doesn't, doesn't go with it. Yeah, it's tourist attraction, isn't it, yeah, for a lot of people now? Exactly, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've not done many in Italy. I've done most of the big ones in Italy. Uh, yeah. Got a few stories about those as well. We went to, to Napoli uh, on the train from the city centre, and then when we walked back to the station to, to get in the yeah. station, it was shut. So, like, it was, how do we get back to the hotel now? So that was a few funny ones. But, I mean, I think, for me, Germany is probably the best to go to as a tourist. No, no, fair play. I mean, I think I'm going to Germany in April with the uh, the Wisewood trip once again to uh, to Bochum. Right. I've been before. Obviously, I wasn't a hopper at the time. <laughs> um, I will be this time. Right. Uh, so hopefully, VFL Bochum will be at home at one point, so I can go see them. Hopefully, maybe on the Sunday. Um, Excellent. Um, so I've had the best grounds. Is there any uh, you don't particularly like? Uh, I don't know. That's really... criticised. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be critical of non-league teams because a lot of clubs are struggling for money and stuff and can't do the grounds up. But I think if I tried to tie that question in to maybe like Premier League grounds, so yeah. I've obviously been to like a lot of Premier League ones. I'm not a fan of Wolves because the, okay. the where you sit in the Wolves, it seems to be like a long way from the pitch. I think when they built that yeah. ground in the 80s and stuff, the John Ireland stand as it was at the time was quite away and they moved the others across. But you still feel as if you're a long way away from the pitch at Wolves. And mm -hmm. it's a strange one where you, you sit on the lower tier and you've got people above you and there's missiles and whatever coming down. So that's one of the ones I don't particularly like going to. And then we had Leeds the other night and Leeds to me again, they've moved the away fans from the corner into the West End. And the West End accessible isn't the best access. So you'll come up the, up, come up the, uh, the gangway and yeah. you'll be walking through people to get to your seats. There's no obvious like aisles and stuff. Mm. Um, it seems to be massively cramped. The views you yeah. get are great. Um, I used to take a guy in a wheelchair in the 90s who I was good mates with, I worked with. And some of the wheelchair disability places in some of these grounds are like, you know, you're looking from a very low level up onto the pitch. Others just sort of the behind fans. And I think I saw a picture of a wheelchair enclosure at Leeds where they were in the corner and all the stewards were stood in the way. I think there was one in Villa yesterday with Man City. So I don't think I think clubs have got better managing like disabled people and and wheelchair users and so on. But it's uh, it's not hundred percent great. And it's I think at Leeds the view you you're very sort of squashed up. 
the access isn't brilliant. When you're down below in the tunnel or whatever, and they buy the food bits, it's very cramped. But grounds are getting better, and hopefully these will improve. But there's no ground that I don't like. I mean, you know, we're in a hobby where I don't like going to Anfield. I know that. Well, no, we're in a hobby where, you know, every ground's different. Every ground we like for a different reason. And, yep. you know, it's wrong for me to say I don't like X because of whatever. You know, there might be a reason why X hasn't got the money to, to make it any yep. better. So to me, even if it's like awful you stood out in the rain because there's no roof, to me it's a football ground and I like going to football ground. So just get on with it. Good point. Very good point, mate. Fair enough. Um, Let's move on to fans then. Who are the best fans on your travels you've seen? And uh, be as biased as you like. <laughs> uh, in terms of fans, I mean, again, the atmosphere and grounds in Germany, as I touched on before, yeah. were good. I like the Dortmund fans. That was like they created a really good atmosphere. Again, I touched on sporting in, in Spain. I thought they created a really good atmosphere, bearing in mind the team weren't good and they were struggling. So I think... Of the ones abroad, they were probably the best yeah. fans that have been. But I'm, you know, I'm only commenting on one game at each ground. Yeah. I, you know, I might go to another game at that ground. The fans might be awful. Um, I'm not saying there's any anything brilliant in at home. I mean, you go to some grounds and the the fans are fine. You go to some ground and it's a bit of a naughty atmosphere. I yeah. think one positive thing I would say over the last couple of years, the times I've gone to Brentford, is. Every time I've gone to Brentford, I've never seen any hassle and you can walk around with your shirt on and nobody says anything. Some grounds you might think, I'm not walking around before the game with my shirt off, you're sitting in the town centre or around the ground because you don't know what you're going to get. But in terms of, I'm not saying the best fans because, you know, obviously they've been in the lower leagues and so on and they're, they're rightly enjoying the time in the Premiership. But as an away supporter, it's been, it's been comfortable going to Brentford for the last two years and not having any sort of fear. You'd always, you know, you always might come across one idiot and so on, but yeah. it's been one of those where it's like a family club and it's been enjoyable to go as an away fan, enjoy the game, but also to be able to walk around before and after with your shirt on and not have to worry about anything coming from behind or in front. Yeah. So I wouldn't say they're the best in terms of the best, but in terms of like, you know, uh, the best, yeah, the best fans, I mean, as I said before, you've got the Barcelona's, Real Madrid's and Bayern. They're so used to winning. The fans don't create a great atmosphere. It tends to feel as if it's the, the teams that are struggling. Kaiserslautern, for example, that was a brilliant atmosphere. They lost on the day I went, but it was a really good atmosphere. Now, you might ask a German guy that, and they might say, well, Kaiserslautern was, isn't the greatest game for, or their fans aren't great. But the day I went, they were. So, you know, it's it's just picking up from, from games that you've gone to. Oh, fair point. Do you reckon I'd, uh, you know, my blog, do you reckon I'd give out a few 40s to the German clubs? <laughs> you know, 40 uh, I think you would. I think you'd enjoy going there. Yeah, your blog yeah. would really fit in with that. Yeah, I think you would, Dave. No, well, no, hopefully no. you would, do anyway, because I yeah, oh, want you to you. enjoy it when you're there. Yeah, well, so hopefully in April next year, hopefully I'll get one in. Right, are you doing more than just Bochum or are you doing just doing Bochum? I don't know. I mean, last time I went, I know where my friend Brian got a ticket for Schalke uh, the Saturday evening. Um, I, th I think Bochum played uh, on the Sunday uh, morning at 12 uh, at midday. Yeah. Uh, it finished nil nil. I know they watched it on telly. I don't, I don't, they didn't go. But like, I mean, now now I am a hopper. I think yeah. I'll probably have a look a lot more. To see well, if you've got me loads of grounds around that region and you've got yeah. like options on a Sunday afternoon, some player two, some player four. And if yeah. you've got transport, you can get round quickly. That's one of the things we've done now. We hire cars when we go abroad. Yeah. We didn't do it for ages uh, because we didn't know how to and you didn't know mm -hmm. if you were going to be confident driving and so on. Yeah. But now when we do a trip, we virtually always hire a car yeah. and it, it just opens so many things up. We went to Berlin one weekend and did one grand here for, and then people, like when you look back now, we probably could have done about six or seven. Yeah. But at the time, we didn't know anything about it. We just knew the hearth and we're at home and that's all we had to do, get to the ground. Whereas having a car, especially if you're going to Boca, there's loads of teams in that region that you can get to for different times and try and get a couple in. And you're close to the border with Holland and Belgium as well. Absolutely. I'm sure yeah. we're not the, the furthest of uh, car journeys away. But <laughs> so, about the best? What about the worst bands? 
the worst fans, right? So you put me on the spot here. I am putting uh, on the spot here. Again, yeah. I can only say from experience of, of games that I've gone to, uh, we had two cup games away to Bristol City in the 90s, and both of them were great as an away fan. Uh, okay. They came on the pitch once when we, we scored and we were sort of celebrating. Some of their fans come outside, on, out the stand and onto the pitch. Uh, we had to have police horses on the pitch and so on. Then the, the journey back to the coaches weren't, weren't, wasn't particularly great. Uh, we were attacked from a couple of sides. So, I mean, Bristol City fans might be great guys normally, but all I can say is on the, the two games I went to Ashton Gate, when Everton played in the FA Cup, we won both of them and they were full houses. And whether it brought some of the, the people out that wouldn't only support the club who were just there because there was a big team there and there was potential for problems, I don't know. So I don't really particularly want to say Bristol City the worst fans ever because they're yeah. probably not. But based on the experiences I had at those games. And then the only other one, we had a funny one. When we went to Turkey, we went to Istanbul and... Uh, we went to a third division game and didn't really think about any issues with fans or anything. And uh, we went to a game which was, I think might have been a local derby, I'm not sure. Don't even know anything where the away team come from. And they had about 100 supporters who caused endless problems inside the stadium and after. And again, I'm not saying that they're the worst fans we've ever experienced, but it wasn't the most comfortable afternoon because you were watching more what was going on between the two sets of fans. And then yeah. when you come out the ground, you don't know where you're going because you're in a strange place and you're having to try and avoid a potential uh, clash with with these fans that were obviously uh, up for it. So yeah. I don't think you, I can actually label anyone as worst fans, but we have had, I've had issues with different sets of fans over the years. Most well, of the time enough. I've been fine. Most of the time I try and pick the... The games where you're not going to have a like hassle, but I've tried to do a few derbies recently. I've done Preston Blackpool, uh, Burnley yeah. Blackburn, uh, tried to get the experience of what it's like going to those type of games and yeah. they are red hot atmospheres, as we all know. But yeah. you know, I certainly wouldn't put any of those fans in categories as the worst, but you don't know who's the worst, are you? Because you know, it could be guys who don't normally go to the game who just come out because there's a big team in town. Yeah, and just to look for a, look for trouble as they normally do, unfortunately. But uh, what's it like with Manchester uh, Mansfield Chesterfield games? <laughs> well, I went last time we played it was twenty eighteen. Me and my younger brother Joe got a ticket in the away end. Um, right. We were sat in the side stand because they gave us two blocks of the side stand because the ticket demand. We took two thousand seven hundred over. Uh, we needed a win to hopefully help our uh, playoff push. They needed a win because they were at the bottom of the league. So the year they went down. Um, now, before the game, we went into a, into a bar in the town centre. We got a bar allocated to us. Um, and I was a bit questionable, the police, on that day. I weren't really sure they were on top form, if you like. Um, we were looking forward to what we were going to do in March, because we've done it before at Notts County. We've had a march from the, uh, it's called the Waterfront Bar in Nottingham, that I've been before, it. took to the ground. Um, yeah. Always amazing. Love it. Um, Chester Vio, looking forward to the march. It's, 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 I'd say it's a bit of a longer walk than the Nottingham walk, but still doable, no problem. Um, and then we got told that the police were holding us at the bar and they were going to get us a coach now, which, well, fair enough. But the weight just kept going on. And I'm thinking, we're going to miss this year. And obviously, we're, we've had a couple of drinks. We started mm -hmm. yellows, yellows, and all that. Um, but the coach did come. We got there about you know, 15 minutes prior to kickoff. So we thought, well, that's all right then. No worries. Um, obviously, a bit of banter between two fans. You're looking at each other and all that sort yeah. of stuff. And a couple of that. Um, we won the game 1 0, which. We loved uh, Mal Benning, uh, who scored for us, who's now scored against us for Port Vale in the playoff final, which broke our hearts, unfortunately. We, we called him Sir Mal. You know, some yeah, fans played for Port Vale. Yeah. Um, after the game, well, we, 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 were held, we were held back. Uh, but my brother was uh, quite short at the time. Uh, and police let him through. And obviously, Sal's wouldn't let me through as well. We were walking down. And uh, I can remember walking past the pub. Um, just opposite the ground and a Budweiser bottle literally just right next to my head. Yeah. Really close. If I, if I had a look, it would have got me. I don't know what would have happened. And I can hear him chanting, we ain't no bastards in yellow and blue. Um, I don't think they knew I was a Mansfield fan at the time, obviously, but but yeah, I walked past. There was a bit of trouble with some fans, but it's, it's nothing, nothing too crazy. It's nothing 
like West Ham or Millwall or any other massive derby. Nothing like Sheff- Sheffield derby. Nothing like that at all. Obviously, yeah. it's not a, a big scale, but there is hatred there. I will say that, definitely. Right. Okay. And was that hatred because of, like, the minor strike and stuff like that? Was yeah. Nottingham clusters, the yeah. scabs and stuff? and <laughs> Yeah, Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, obviously different counties. Yeah. And, yeah, I think there was a minor's... A political mm-hmm. minus thing involved Going back yeah, in the eighties. And yeah. what's it like when you play Forest or? Well, I don't. You probably don't play Forest loads, but Notts County. Well, Forest is a friendly rivalry. I've, I've I've been to been into Nottingham and I've told Forest fans I'm a Mansfield fan. They shook hands saying, "Oh, we like we like Mansfield fans." But right. Notts County, pretty much more of the same, really. A bit yeah. of hate. Yeah, there's a bit of hatred there. I won't say it's the same as Chesterfield on that scale, but like you know. It, there is, there is a little bit of hatred there, but with right. Forest, obviously, we've not played in competitive fixtures because we've never been in the same league. We do play each other pre season literally every year, mostly. Right. And is that not this year? It's a bit in Prem, but like yeah. Forest, I mean, some some Forest fans go and watch Mansfield when they're away because they can't get a ticket, you know. So it's, yeah. I mean, obviously, some, Man- some Mansfield fans do the same for Forest. Yeah, so it's, Forest. A bit of, it's a friendly rivalry, really. It's a bit like Rotherham Sheffield United. They don't hate each other. They, they both hate Wednesday more than anything. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah it's mad that, isn't it? Yeah, it's just one of those things. Well, obviously, Notts County have been lower leagues as well, so we've been playing them regularly. And obviously, with it being close by, you class it as a dog. But Forest has always been it. And, and I'd imagine it'd be the same if we ever did play each other in a competitive yeah. game as well. See, we, I used to go to Tramir and Loch in the 90s. They they used to play Friday nights and Monday nights. Yeah. So they'd never, they'd never play Saturday, or very rarely play Saturday. So it was yeah. great that you could go on a Friday night and watch a game in the fourth division or whatever. Yeah. They'd play on a Monday night as well, so you could watch a and so on but it started to become apparent if they played on a, on a day when Everton or Liverpool played when they read out the scores most people would cheer if Everton were losing and cheer if Liverpool were winning and I'm starting to think like there's a lot of Everton fans come and watch Tron there obviously yeah. there's Liverpool as well but we didn't realise that they disliked Everton as much as they do when the when they half-time scores are read out oh. and then we played them in the FA Cup and they beat us and that didn't go down too well. They beat us at Goodison. But it, it feels now when you go to Tramia to watch a game, there's a little bit of tension when Everton play. But it seems to be really friendly when Liverpool play. And there's no logical explanation for it that I know of anyway. Just one of those things. I, th- I think for Rotherham and Wednesday, I think it's because there's a lot of uh, Rotherham Wednesday fan groups, which obviously uh, that's not going to go down too well. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's, well, that's one thing I know. I'd imagine that that would be the reason why. Um, I always thought it was the way around with Tramby. I thought they hated Liverpool more. So Don't did I. But, I mean, I can only tell from when we've gone to games where they read out the half-time scores. But I don't know. I don't know why. Must be more Tramby fans seem yeah. to like Liverpool more. I don't know. Maybe. It's a big mystery. It yeah. certainly is. So, another tricky question for you. And only because you've done so many. But is there any ground that you haven't visited that you really would like to visit? Yeah, I think most people would like to do South America, and that's always been on my agenda yeah. for a while. Yeah, uh, I'd love to go to the Bombonera, I'd love to go to the Maracanã, uh, and a couple of others over there as well. Whether we ever get round to doing it, I don't know. It was, uh, I think, we'd originally planned a couple of years ago, we'd go a Thursday to a week Monday, so we'd have two full weekends in Argentina, so everyone would be at home if we if the fixes worked out like that. Yeah. So we'd have a chance of doing it. But we just never got around to doing it because that one we didn't get to because I just started the new job and I wasn't allowed to have that much time off at the start. Yeah. And then we were lucky because I think they had a strike in Argentina at the time and there was no games played. So I can imagine going all that way there and not seeing any games. But South America stands out for me as the ones I would really like to go to. Uh, one of my mates did a great one in 2011, I think it was. He went to see England play Brazil at the American R on the Sunday. He then saw a game in Uruguay on the Wednesday in a friendly. And then he went to Argentina on, on the Friday. So he got all three in one week in one trip. That would be brilliant for me. The other one I'd really like to go to is to go and see the team in uh, Chile called Everton. There's a team in Chile that's called Everton. And we played each other in 2006 as a bit of a pre-season friendly. Yeah. And uh, they came to Goodison. And there's a lot of Everton fans who keep in touch with the way they are, the, how they're doing and so on. And there's a little group formed. And I think it'd be brilliant to go to Chile and watch Everton. Ideally, the proper Everton team and could be the opponents, but not necessarily. Yeah. So I, I keep thinking, if I, if I go to South America, I've got to go for a long enough time to do a couple more countries, not just do Argentina. 
get the game in Brazil. I could have yeah. gone to the Brazil World Cup with the mates. Five of us went from Liverpool. Five of them went from Liverpool. But they stayed in one city, in Fortaleza, and saw five games in the same ground. And I said, well, I'm not going to Brazil. I'm not going to Rio. And they said, oh, yeah, well, you know, we're booking in this hotel. We're staying there for two weeks. Different teams are playing there. And I said, well, I'm not going to one ground. But they enjoyed it. They had a fab time. But to me, it's about, if I'm going to Brazil, I've got to go to Rio. And I've got to see a game yep. in the Mount Canal. Oh, yeah. uh, so they're the ones that basically stand out the South Americans. The only other ones I'd say is that at one point I'd actually done all the top division in Germany, Holland and Spain. So mm -hmm. each time a team comes up, the new one's on the agenda. But yeah. whether they I mean, I've lost it now with the last couple of years with COVID, I've not been. So the other ones like Freiburg's new ground, I'd like to do that. Uh, okay. There's a couple in France I'd like to do. I'd like yeah. to do Como because when I went to Milan, that ground right on Lake Como. Uh, yes. And it's a cracking location right yeah. on the lake. So next time I go to Italy, that's going to be on the agenda. But I think it's, as you know, Jake, it's an, it's an ever finishing agenda, isn't it? Because yeah. once you've done them, there'll be other ones that you want to do as well. There's Absolutely. that ground in, in Hungary, which is all the wooden the wooden ground all the way through. It's cool. I forgot what it's called, but yeah, I know which one you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. And then just incredible. before COVID, we were going to Ukraine and we were doing one of the unusual ones in, in Kiev. But we never ended up going, and now like the chances of us going are sort of not very high. So yeah. we did get to the point where we tried to do the, the 56 European countries as well, 55, and we got to 42. And that's all sort of drifted away now as well because of what's happened in the last two years. So one day, who knows? It would be nice to have done a game in every one of the European countries. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, thought that you mentioned there, Bombardier, that is my dream. Round yeah. the, that Boca Juniors ideally against River Plate. I, yeah. I can imagine me giving them 41. They might have 40. <laughs> yeah, I think you, it might be a bit more than 41, I guess. But it certainly well, be up there. It certainly wouldn't be down in single figures, would it? No, no way. I don't think I've had so, a yeah, single figure. And I think from what I've been told, it's not easy to get a ticket, but as a tourist, you've got a good chance of getting tickets through hotels. And yes. there's like different companies who do them as well. Yes. So you can you can pay like a, a, a bit higher in terms of the fee and you'll yeah. get a ticket for the game. So I think that'd be brilliant. Start on the top tier as well. I don't think I'd want to go down at the bottom. I want to be oh. up at the top, seeing everything. You get absolutely pole if they scored down at the bottom anyway. Yeah. Be, yeah. But one so day. We dream. We can all dream and maybe one day we can do it. One day, yeah. Uh, before I go on to the women's Euro, I've just got one another question that's going to put you on the spot. But I've, I've asked this to the Hoppers essentially. But if you could bring back one demolished ground from the dead, what would you what would you go with? Do you think one demolished ground from the dead? Right, I'm asking you now question. before Goodison goes, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think for me, I mean, you can look at that two ways. One, would I bring a ground back that I'd been to that I really enjoyed? And if yeah. I did, I'd probably say Sunderland Roker Park okay. because. The the reason I said that is that ended up being uh, my 92nd league ground. Well, when I say oh, wow. it was my 92nd league ground, it wasn't. I'd already been to Portsmouth and one of my mates supported Sunderland and he got them to do a pitch presentation for me and I've got a big painting on the wall from yeah. in the 18, 1890s from a game at Roker Park. And I went to Roker Park, obviously a few times with Everton, but I, I actually like going as a neutral so when I was at uni in Leeds, I went up a few times and watched games. Atmosphere was brilliant, standing on the four-wheel end. And that was great. So if I was going to bring a ground back that I'd already been to, I'd go for Sunderland. Yeah. If I was going to bring a ground back that I hadn't been to, I think I touched on before, Newport County. I would have yeah. loved to have gone to a game at Summerton Park. They played in the Cup Winners' Cup there when they won the Welsh Cup a couple of times. I think Napoli played there. There was yeah. other big European teams. Mm -hmm. And I think in Scotland, the only one that I would, apart from St Johnston, the one yeah. I really wanted to go to was to see Clyde at Shawfield, where they've okay. got the dog, tra the dog track now. And it's still there, and it still mm -hmm. exists, but there's no football on it. So I think between the, the two... It's either one that I've been to or one that I've not been to. Some of them because I would have wanted to have gone and I'm gutted that I didn't go. And for for, for what I went, Sunderland would have to be the one at Roker Park. Fair play. Fair play. I mean, for me, I'd probably say Booth and Crescent. Only because I've got friends at York City and I'd love to just, you know, experience it with them once. And and one that I didn't go to would be uh, Brentford Griffin Park, just to have a beer at every yeah. pub. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. There's loads. I mean, it's an ever-endless one, isn't it? You could. Oh, man, I mean, yeah. I like Boothbury Park. I mean, there was one year yeah. when I had a choice. Where do you want to go for your birthday weekend? And I said, Hull. And I'm like, why do you want to go to Hull? I want to go to Boothbury Park. And it was, I'd already been there once. And it was near to its end. And I said, I've got to go back because I want to go to Boothbury Park. So we went yeah. to Hull. So, yeah, I mean, you, you could go through them all. They've all got uh, traits that you actually liked, if you like. With, with some of these grounds. Um, but I do think Sunderland Middlesbrough and Ayrson Park was a good one to go to, not as an away fan, because you got like a bad time in Ayrson Park, but as a ground and the atmosphere and the standing on terraces and, and whatever, and the typical feel of a ground, somewhere yeah. like Ayrson Park would have been good. And a lot of yeah, these new ones are nowhere near as, as atmospheric as the old ones, but they're you know, yeah. obviously there for a reason. Probably yeah, ask that in three years' time and I'll say good, doesn't I'm sure you will, man. I'm sure you will, yeah. yeah. So let's um let's touch on the women's Euros then. How about it? What a tournament. It was brilliant actually, because uh, I ended up uh bought 17 tickets in yeah. the previous summer. Because uh, when the tickets went on sale, we hadn't been to games for the whole season because it was we were in lockdown. So I looked at and thought, oh, if we can take a couple of weeks off work. I did it for Euro 96. I picked games where it was in Newcastle one night, Leeds the next okay. night, Sheffield. So I thought, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to like pick these games. And the tickets were £10, £15. So I think I ended up buying 17 tickets and I think it was £210. And I thought, OK, it's a lot of money, but seeing 17 games. When it came around, wasn't sure until after the first few games what it was going to be like. But I ended up doing three games in Lee, two in Manchester, two in Sheffield two in Rotherham, and then the ultimate, the final at Wembley. And Sheffield was brilliant for the semi-final. I mean, Sheffield Wednesday is a typical football ground. Sheffield United, yeah. sorry. So when they were playing at the mini Etihad, when they were playing at Lee, they weren't football grounds to me. They were like, yeah, they were nice little stadiums, but the players weren't playing in proper football grounds. When I went to the one at Bramall Lane on the Tuesday for England semi-final, full house, great atmosphere, England yeah. played brilliantly, won 4 0. Suddenly, like it was the feeling of, I've got a ticket for the final. And then yeah. people are going, Oh, wow, do you have a ticket for the final? Can you still get one? And stuff. And I said, No, I've had mine a year. £15 it was. People were yeah. paying like three or four hundred pounds. So <clears throat> the funny thing about that was uh, every year I go on a golf weekend, which is Thursday to Sunday, and it was the end of July. And I was going on the golf weekend to North Wales. And um, the guy who runs it said to me, uh, you're staying for the four days, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not staying on the Sunday. Why not? So I said, I'm going to the England Euro. I'm going to the Euro final. Because obviously England weren't in it at the time. So yeah. he said to me, why do you want to go and watch the ladies final and go all the way to Wembley when we're on a weekend? So I said, well, to me, it's a, it's the final of a competition I've never done. You don't know who's yeah. going to be in it. Um, you know, if it's a final, it's going to be a good game, hopefully. So um, as the tournament progressed and it started to look like England were in it, I was starting to feel like this is going to work out good here because I'm going to, not only am I going to go to Wembley, but I'm also going to get to see England. And yeah. the ironic thing for me is I've never watched the England men's team at Wembley. I've never, no. all the games I've been to, I've never seen England at Wembley. So when I, when I had the ticket for that, I suddenly had the first England game at Wembley to final. And yeah. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I, I had the feeling from the semi-final that it was a, a really good atmosphere. The type yeah. of people that went was like families, uh, lots of girls on their own. Uh, there wasn't like loads of lads, if you know what I mean. It wasn't like, a, you know, like when we're going to normal games where there's like loads of lads. It was a lot of families, a lot of girls on their own, a lot of younger people. And the atmospheres were good. So when it comes to going to Wembley, it was just like a completely different experience. Going yeah. and watching your own team in a cup final is brilliant. You can't really beat there, especially if they win. But yeah. that was like just a completely different atmosphere. You got, as soon as you got off the train, it was a good feeling. There was like people were buzzing and, you know, going up to the ground. And I think there's a funny thing that I, I actually said. I was waiting in the queue at the top of the steps to buy a programme. And there was this young girl standing out just outside the ground looked yeah. as if she was waiting to give a ticket to someone. And I looked over to her and I thought, I actually recognise that girl, but I don't know who she is. So different people out the queue started going over and getting selfies with her. And I'm standing there thinking, I like, still don't know who she is. I mean, I've watched them, but I don't know who it is. Yeah. When I seen them get the cup, it was the captain. 
she was standing outside Wembley an hour and a half before the kickoff, not in obviously not in a kit or a trackie, just in yeah. normal clothes. She was waiting for one of her mates to give her a ticket. And you're thinking, like, can you imagine Harry Kane standing outside before a World Cup final outside the ground, like, and everyone? And it was just, it was bizarre to think wow. that that girl was standing outside waiting to give someone a ticket. And nobody, I would say nobody recognised her. A few people recognised her, but most people didn't. After the game, when they'd won, I'm sure everyone probably would have recognised her. <laughs> yeah. But I had, like, I had a good seat. I actually saw you in the game, which made it even better. And <laughs> it was just a really good atmosphere, and it was oh. great to say you'd been there and oh, see yeah. her, and England won as well. And I think the way the game went is the fact that England scored first, so you got the excitement of that. Then Germany equalised, so you then got the the despair as such. Oh great, it's Germany again, and we're going to lose. And then to get a toe poked winner in extra time oh, at the end that we were sat at, both yeah. goals oh. were on our end. That's um, yeah. It, was just a, it was just a really good feeling, but a different feeling from when it's your own team. Because obviously yeah. when it's your own team, you're more right into it. Mm. But here you could actually watch it and enjoy it, if you know yeah. what I mean. I don't, well, think, I don't think I've been more calm going to Wembley for a cup yeah. final ever. Yeah, well, that's I it. mean, I was it's there. Your team. You're panicking, yeah. aren't you? And you don't know what it's going to be like. And Yeah, I was there a couple of weeks earlier for Mansfield in the playoff final. And I mean, I'll give it to you. I mean, outside the ground... Pretty good, a bit, 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 bit of nerves there, but inside the concourse, I mean, shirts off, I'd be brother on my shoulders. <laughs> yeah, look, yeah, look, yeah, look. all that. And, but it going into there, calm, very friendly as well, I have to say. You know, yeah, very yeah. family orientated. I mean, yeah. I mean, I get, I get the atmosphere at 10, but I don't think it was as good as Bramall Lane, personally. I mean, I was sat near the band at Bramall Lane, so it obviously helped. Yeah. But, um, I, I, the only thing that did it for me was I've never been in a ground where, you know, when England went forward, you know, Lauren Hemp, uh, Hemp got the ball. It was like, you know, the anticipation, that yeah. was borderline definite. That was amazing. And then obviously, when you're appealing as well, it's a lot louder with that many fans. And I, I can remember referee booking to, I think it was Leah Williamson got booked, somebody else did and never, yeah. you know, I mean, if that was a, there's you not know, as much aggression team. towards the referee, but there's a few shouts. I mean, you know, if it played off fine, yeah, you know, yeah. Like, I, mean, I, I was shouting the ref, but like, Oh, but it was no, it was just a really good, friendly atmosphere, but yeah. enjoyable as well. And That's I came true. away. I mean, I didn't because I was driving home afterwards. I didn't stay for the whole lap of honour and stuff. I seen them get the cup, yeah. and I got got sort of going at that point. Now, obviously, if it was your own team, you'd stay in the ground for as long as you could, and you wouldn't want to ever leave. Because I was like back on the train and then had to drive from yeah. Hillingdon. Uh, I wanted to try and get back with it being a late kick off as well. But it was just one of those where you come away and think, I'm really glad I was there. Yeah, and really, so. it's one of those things you can look back. And some people might say, oh, it was only the women's. But at the end of the day, they won the, the trophy that they went in. You see, in England, win a trophy in England, which yep. not many people can say. There's not no. many people still alive who went with the 66 World Cup final. No. And, you know, we can say we've seen England win a trophy, albeit it wasn't the men's one, but it was still the women's and it was still a, valid, a decent trophy to win. And it was really so. enjoyable. And the first time they ever won it as well. Yeah, yeah. We, we Football were there, came home, we? we were there. But yeah. I have to say, I can remember, obviously, it being at our end, Ella Tungs were on goal, and when she poked it, that was the slowest I've ever seen a ball drop ever. Dropping it, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was and then that ball, that ball was like, <laughs> yeah. got in. Hello. And obviously, you know, I was thinking exactly what I probably you were thinking. It's going to get the penalties and we're going to lose to Germans. And they had the post as well, didn't he? After, did they? After they had the, the post, post after they scored or before they scored? Was it after? Can't remember. I can't remember. I think I think it might have been after. I think it was straight after, I think. Yeah. And obviously it just fell for Chloe Kelly perfectly. And I thought, looks on our side, we're winning this. We are yeah. winning this. And didn't he manage the game well in the last five or ten minutes where that they ran the ball into the corner? The Army gave the Germans a kick of the ball at all. They just game yeah. managed it so well. Absolutely. Um, yeah. But it was just a cracking atmosphere to be there and loved it. Yeah. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And, uh, and and like we say now, women's football's on the rise. You're getting like a twenty, you know, thirty k season tickets. Oh, that's, that's half the ground season tickets. They're going to be yeah. designated away end soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Everton are still playing at Walton Hall, and I don't know how popular it's going to be because we've got our first game next Sunday against Leicester. I think it is, and yeah. I mean that's only a very small ground. So yeah. they've never, I'd say they've never played a good. So I think they played two or three games there. Whether they'll 
they'll have to reconsider because depending on the on the upturn of how many people want tickets on the yeah. back of the women's winning, then they might end up having to say, well, we don't want to have what and all sold out with 500 every game. We want to play it somewhere bigger. Because I think having Tottenham played at uh, the White Hart Lane and they've got 20 or oh, thousand. They will be doing, yeah. I mean, I spoke to the girl around the, on the show uh, Thursday night, yeah. She, she'll be going, takes at the big ground, uh, right. the, the, the men's ground, sorry. <clears throat> um, but, but yeah, I mean, Everton... <laughs> I know, um, I know Liverpool, Everton on Sunday, women's uh, Merseyside derby. I know that's going to be played at Anfield. Yeah, that's a, that's the week after, isn't it? I think it's the end of this month. I think it's in three weeks. Three weeks today, yeah. I believe. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's at Anfield. That's the, but they played that at Anfield last year. But when yeah. we played we played Liverpool, we played them at Walton Hall, which is like a bit mad when there's only 500 people can go. Yeah. I mean, was there a big crowd exactly at Anfield last season? Yeah. Uh, 2021, 20, I think it was. 21,000? I think so, yeah. I think yeah, I didn't good. go, but I think we got certainly into the 20s, I think it was. I'm, I'm considering it at the moment, I'll be honest. Okay. Um, just, you know, so I can go to Anfield again. You can come and sit with me anyway, and then... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, we'll uh, wrap it up, mate, with the last question that we ask everybody. Okay. The big one. We'd like you to try and sum up football in three words. And it can be Ooh. three separate words or a three-word phrase. What what would you think right. you go with? Okay. Uh, I would say enjoyment, because I wouldn't yep. go if we didn't enjoy it. And I think probably enjoyment, I would probably refer that to the like the neutral games I go to, the non-league games, the neutral games, because you go there to enjoy them, and most of the time you do. Yeah. Uh, I think from watching Everton, you've got the I would probably say the other two words would probably excitement and despair so you get the excitement of when they win and some of the games that they go through and the excitement at the end the despair when they lose and when you know when it doesn't go so well so I think I'd probably say them three I mean you could probably turn around and put some other words to it but I would yeah. say them three probably I mean you could say frustrating at yeah. times you could say it's expensive but that's yeah. yeah I mean that's not the case with everything but I think for me Football's an enjoyable sport. I enjoy going, uh, even if it's a rubbish match, there will be some positives out of it that I'll have enjoyed yeah. doing it. And I wouldn't go to so many games if I didn't enjoy it. And I'd probably say, I mean, the first, uh, the despair and the excitement you probably only get from your own team. But yeah. you also feel, after, you, you go to other games. We went to a game on Friday night in Wales. Um, little ground in North Wales, three of us went. And the game was 5-4. And it was a really good game to watch. Uh, yeah, but... Went to end. Both teams were in front. It was a cup game. And I'm not saying that was massively exciting, but it was for the neutral. We enjoyed yeah. it. But it was an exciting game to watch and watch the fans of both teams going yeah. through the 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 agonies of winning and the this the oh, sorry the agonies of losing and the the excitement of winning. So for me, I'd probably say those three words: enjoyment, we we excitement, were. despair. Enjoyment, pleasure, and despair. I guess. I, okay. I, yeah. Pleasure. What's everyone yeah. else? Had? Is it similar things? Or well, we've had a few. We've had a few uh, interesting ones. Uh, right. Va Vaughny, Vaughny's was one I really like. Okay. This, the, Vaughny's was the one that he used to sum up non-league. I'd personally used to sum up the women's game. Uh, just try it. Quite like that one. Just try uh, it. We, yeah. Just oh, try so it. A phrase rather than. But whichever. We, we, right, we've okay. had people. I mean, pa passion's probably the most popular word that we've had. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I've, 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 so many with passion. Yeah, exciting's one. Uh, uh, travel uh, for us hoppers. That was one from Laurie yeah. Reed. I can't, I can't remember so many phrases, but like. Uh, I suppose you could say universal as well, isn't it? Because it's universal for everyone, isn't it? Yeah, we've, we've had that one. Yeah, we've had that also. One. Yeah, we've yeah. had a few. I think, unpredictable adventure we've had uh, yeah. from from somebody. Um, someone, some. I think I remember one player came. We had a league player come on and say religion. As well, at right. one point, so yeah, some very interesting ones, definitely. But right. passion is normally passions, yeah, it's a few times, isn't it? Definitely, but, excellent. But, mate, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, that did not You're disappoint welcome. one bit. Pardon, and um, I'm sure I'll see you on the travels again. I'm looking forward to seeing you on your travels. And, like, you know, even when you say about going to non league football, what do you like to go to, to non league football? It's like uh, planning it. And where you're going, new places, some yeah. places I would never have been to, didn't even know where they were. 
I mean, yeah. there was one game in the summer where I did my nearest ground that I'd not been to, and it was somewhere called Pinchback, somewhere over yeah. Boston Way. Yeah. And like, I wouldn't even know where that was unless I'd gone there for football. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you see different things, you see different places, and you, you get to see people you've, you know, friends who you've made over the years at different games. Exactly. And um, like I always like looking at your topless of the turnstiles reports because it's it's great you can relate to it you can remember when you've gone to that ground and you can sort of match it back and it's always good seeing guys from around the country at different games absolutely so that's one of the good things about going to non league because it's it's more personal you you feel as if you're part of the game a little bit more because yeah. it's a big crowd you can walk around and talk to people and you get to know loads of different people so I definitely recommend people going to games. Absolutely. And long may it continue. Definitely. So uh, I'm sure we'll see you again soon, mate. I'd love to see Grunison Park before it goes, obviously, because I've never right. been. Well, speak uh, to me I, before and I'll try and get you a ticket. Yeah, In fact, exactly. I can probably get you tickets for any game this season now because one of your mates has got a membership and as soon okay. as the games go on sale three weeks before, he can yeah. get a member's ticket and he's not going to them all. So if you tell me what game you want to do, and give yeah. me enough notice, I should be able to help you. I will. Yeah, I, I will be in touch, definitely. Okay. Uh, this has been the Fan of Fan podcast, and we'll see you next time.